simple linguistic objects help Greetings from Cyberdelic Space. This is Lorenzo, and I'm your host here in the Psychedelic Salon. And although I had planned on getting this podcast online a couple of days ago, I have to admit that I was unable to tear myself away from watching the rescue of the uh, Chilean miners who were trapped underground for 70 days. And, uh, yes, I'm well aware of the controversy surrounding the 24 by 7 coverage of the event. I also have some uh, other thoughts about it, but uh, I'll cover those after we hear today's talks by uh, Alan Watts. But uh, first, I'd like to thank some of our fellow saloners who were kind enough to donate some of their hard-earned cash to the salon to help offset the expenses associated with these podcasts. And those fine souls are Joshua D., Colin F., Andrea D., Robert M., Anthony D., Jan B., Stephen B., Mark H., and Toby M., uh, who sent in another uh, sizable donation just two weeks after a previous one. And uh, I hope that wasn't a double-click uh, mistake somehow, uh, Toby, uh, that the machines made. And if it was, please let me know so I can uh, send something back to you. But in any event, uh, Toby, Mark, Stephen, Jan, Anthony, Robert, Andrea, Colin, and Joshua. Oh, wow. I can't thank you all enough for your support of the salon. Your uh, notes of encouragement along with your donations and uh, those of our other saloners over the years makes me feel like I'm uh, still doing something that has some value to a lot of people. And, uh, of course, that sure makes me feel good. Now, one more person I want to thank today is Michael H., who sent me the recordings I'm about to play for you. They are both by Alan Watts and appear to be two of those rare Alan Watts treats that haven't been copyrighted somewhere. And uh, so unless I'm told to remove them from our lineup here in the salon, I uh, think we can enjoy them without any guilt. What I'm about to play is actually two short bits that Watts recorded at some unknown time and unknown place. And if you are wondering about uh, the title I chose for today's podcast, which is On Being God and Death, well, (laughs) that's just my own dark humor coming out, because uh, the first talk is about you being divine, and the second one is about death. So I combined the two ideas in a single title just to uh, get your attention, not that you weren't already paying attention, of course. So uh, let's get started with the first talk, and I'll be back after that to introduce the second half of today's program. Between Western psychology, psychiatry, and psychotherapy, and the so-called religions of Asia, there is common ground because both are interested in changing states of human consciousness, whereas institutional Western religion, Christianity, Judaism, and even Islam, are relatively less interested in this matter. Western religions are more concerned with behavior, doctrine, and belief than with any transformation of the way in which we are aware of ourselves and of the world. But this matter concerns psychiatry and psychology very much. Only those states of consciousness which are not normal are usually treated in Western psychology as being in some way sick. There are, of course, exceptions to this, and there have increasingly been exceptions. In the work of Jung, and to some extent even of Grodek, of Prinzhorn, of more modern people, Rogers, and Ronald Lang. Changing consciousness is often looked upon as a form of therapy. But in general, Different states of consciousness from the normal are regarded as a form of sickness. And therefore, official and institutional psychiatry constitutes itself the guardian of sanity and of 
socially approved experience of reality. And very often it seems to me that reality appears rather much the way the world is seen on a bleak Monday morning. In this official doctrine, I might even say dogma, of what reality is. Because after all, we know that our science, such as it is of psychology, is founded in the scientific naturalism of the 19th century. And the metaphysical and mythological assumptions of that science still underlie a great deal of psychological thinking in behaviorism eminently, but also to a large extent in official psychoanalysis. Indeed, one might say that psychoanalysis is based on Newtonian mechanics and, in fact, could be called psychohydraulics. <laughs> Not that that analogy is altogether uh, inappropriate, because there are certainly respects in which our psychic life flows and exhibits the dynamics of water. But, of course, we want to know what kind of water. And for the scientific naturalism of the 19th century, the basic energies of nature were considered to be very much inferior to human consciousness in quality. Ernst Haeckel, a biologist of that time, would think of the energy of the universe as blind energy. And correspondingly, it seems to me that Freud thought of the libido as essentially blind, unconscious energy, embodying only a kind of formless, unstructured, and insatiable lust. This is a generalization. Some modification in that thinking is, of course, possible. But the tendency is to regard all that which lies below the surface of human consciousness as being less evolved, because you must remember that this was also the time of Darwin's theories of evolution, of seeing the human mind as a fortuitous development from much more primitive forms of life coming forth by purely mechanical processes, by natural selection, and by the survival of the fittest. And therefore, man was in general seen as a fluke of nature, an embodiment of reason, emotion and values, for which the more basic processes of nature had no sympathy and about which they did not care. If therefore, the human race is to flourish, we must take charge of evolution. It can no longer be left to spontaneous process, but it must be directed by human ingenuity, despite the fact that although our brains are capable of dealing with a colossal number of variables at once, our conscious attention is not. Most people cannot consider more than three variables at the same time without using a pencil. And this shows that in many ways the scanning process of man's conscious attention is very inadequate for dealing with the infinitely many variables, the multidimensional processes of the natural universe. However, a serious attempt has been made and scientific naturalism issued in a fantastic fight with nature. In this whole notion of the conquest and subordination of nature, which has, as a matter of fact, very ancient, non-scientific and biblical origins, with the idea of man as the head and chief and ruler of nature in the image of God. And the time has now dawned upon us all when our attempts to beat nature into submission are having alarming results. Because we see that it's very dangerous to mess around with processes that we don't understand. 
that have enormous numbers of variables and we begin to wonder whether we hadn't better let well enough alone. At the same time, although I said that Western psychology had more in common or more common interest with Oriental religion than it does with Western religion, there is a sense in which psychiatry and psychotherapy are becoming the religion of the West. Psychoanalysis has much in common with the forms and procedures of institutional religion. There is, for example, apostolic succession. <laughs> the passing down of mana, of qualified power to practice therapy from the father founder, Sigmund Freud, through his immediate apostles, to an enormous company of archbishops and bishops. <laughs> Among whom there are, of course, as there were with Christianity, heresiarchs, such as Jung and Gradek and Rank and Reich. And uh, the, the heresiarchs are duly excommunicated and anathematized. There are rituals, as there are also rituals with religion. There is the sacrament of the couch. <laughs> there is the spiritual discipline of free association. There is the mystic knowledge of the interpretation of dreams. And are, there are also the two great symbolic fetishes, the long one and the round one. <clears throat> Now, it's extraordinarily easy to make fun of all this. And we must not forget that we owe a tremendous debt to Freud, if for nothing else than pointing out that that much of ourselves of which we are aware in terms of the conscious ego is not really ourselves. It is something superficial. However we define its nature, it is superficial. And the realities of human life are not under the gaze of its scanning process, at least not in the ordinary way. And that was a tremendous revelation. There's no question about that. But one sees troublesome signs when the doctrines and processes of psychiatry, psychoanalysis, and so forth become officialized. And I think Thomas Sass, in his books, The Myth of Mental Illness and The Manufacture of Madness, is pointing out something extremely important to us, which is that, in effect, the psychological official of today is the priest and that he is beginning to exercise the same sort of controls over human life as were exercised by the church in the Middle Ages. So that a professor of psychiatry at Columbia or Harvard or Yale medical schools has today the same sort of intellectual re respectability and authority as the professor of theology at the University of Toledo or Padua would have had in the year 1400. Now you must realize that the theologians of those days not simply believed in their cosmology and the theology, they almost knew it was true in the same way that our scientists know certain things to be true despite the fact that they change their opinions very often, while they hold them, they have in effect the force of dogma, as witness the anathematization of Velikovsky for his uncomfortable ideas. And therefore, there are heresies existing today which are persecuted in the same way as heresies were persecuted by the Holy Inquisition. 
and they are persecuted out of kindness in exactly the same way that the Holy Inquisition persecuted heresy out of kindness and deep concern for human beings. That is unimaginable to us, but it was so. For after all, if you seriously believe that someone who did not hold the Catholic faith and who voluntarily rejected it would be tortured physically and spiritually forever and ever and ever in hell, you would resort to almost any means to preserve a fellow human being from such a fate. Especially if the complaint or disease of heresy from which he suffered was infectious. You would first of all reason with him. And if he was not responsive to reason, you would resort to abuse and to forceful argument. And if he was not responsive to that, you would give him shock treatment and bang him about. If that didn't work, the thumb screw and the rack and the iron maiden. And if that didn't work as a last desperate resort, you would burn him at the stake in the pious hope that in the midst of those searing fires, he would think better and make a last act of perfect contrition and so be rescued from everlasting damnation. And you did all this in the spirit of this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. In the spirit of a surgeon who is very, very sorry indeed that he has to uh, make you undergo this extremely painful operation. But it is in your best interests and there really is at least a 50-50 chance that you may survive. And so therefore in perfectly scientific medical spirit, people may be very arbitrarily and without due process deprived of their civil rights incarcerated in prisons that are in many cases much worse than prisons for criminals and generally left to rot be neglected and ignored and when bumptious given shock treatment or put in solitary confinement for what because they have unorthodox and heretical states of consciousness a lot of these people are not dangerous until provoked into being dangerous by being ignored, by being treated as machines, and in generally defined as non-human. And if you are defined as non-human, there's precious little you can do about it. Because everything you say that sounds human will be taken as a kind of utterance of a mechanical man, as imitating humanness out of lunatic cunning. You will be suspicious. Everything you say will be listened to in a different way and with different ears. And you will have one hell of a time talking yourself out of it. Because there really are no rules as to what one must do when incarcerated for having unorthodox consciousness. There is no clear road to repentance. And this is found likewise in jails where people are incarcerated on one to ten year sentences as in places like Vacaville, California where when I visited such prisons young men have come to me in perfect desperation saying I don't know what's happened to me because I want to uh, live like a decent citizen I know I've done things that are wrong but I simply don't know what, I, what is expected of me here if I try to do what's expected they say I'm compliant and that seems to be some sort of a sickness. Thomas Sass drew attention to this when he quoted a discussion of the types of school children who may very well need therapy. There were overachieving children. There were underachieving children. There were children who exhibited erratic patterns. There were children who were sort of dully mediocre. In fact, every sort of child can be given a diagnostic name for his behavior which sounds sick as Jung once suggested life itself is a disease with a very poor prognosis it lingers on for years and invariably ends with death <laughs> and I submit that in our present knowledge of the human mind such power in the hands of psychiatrists is amazingly dangerous 
For I would suggest that today we know about as much concerning the human mind as we knew about the galaxy in 1300. And that while there are indeed individuals who are certainly able to perform psychotherapy, it is the sheerest arrogance for anybody to say that he is officially qualified to do so. We do not know how it is done just as we do not know, really, how musical, artistic, and literary genius is done. You cannot really teach it. You can put the tools for doing these things into people's hands, and you can show them how to use the tools. But whether they will use those tools with genius is quite unpredictable. And this is above all true of the art of psychotherapy. We don't know how it's done, We've got some vague ideas. There probably are some people who, by reason of their mental derangement, are probably not qualified to perform it because they are maybe out just to make other people into messes. But to say that there are certain standards and certain examinations that can be passed and certificates that could be issued, which do indeed qualify people for this work, is, I think, pernicious nonsense. <laughs> and is used, of course, out of economic self-interest when those who consider themselves official therapists run into competition. The same was done by religion. I was talking, imagine it, to a Buddhist priest in Thailand some years ago. I was looking at some books in a bookshop in the precincts of a Buddhist temple. And I was wandering over, and uh, I noticed a book on a certain form of Buddhist meditation. And I murmured, hmm, Satipatthana, which is the name of a certain kind of Buddhist meditation. And uh, a voice suddenly said to me, you practice Satipatthana? I looked up, and there was a skinny Buddhist monk in a yellow robe with rather red eyes looking at me. I said, not exactly Satipatthana. I use a different method. It's called Zen. Oh, Satipatthana, not Zen. I said, oh, well, it's something like it, isn't it? No. Well, it's rather like yoga, I said, isn't it? Not yoga, no. Satipatthana, different. Only right way. <laughs> well, look, I said to him, I have a lot of Roman Catholic friends who tell me that their way is the only right way. Who am I to believe? You know, I said, you know, you're like someone who's got a, uh, a ferry boat for crossing the river. I use the Buddhist simile. And another fellow down the stream has opened up ferry business. And you go to the government and say, he's not authorized to operate a ferry boat because he's competition to you. Let all operate ferry boats who will. And if you haven't got the sense to get off, to stay off one that sinks, it's your fault. <laughs> and after all, I could say to him, you believe that everything that happens to you is your own karma. So why worry? But now, it's so interesting that since official psychiatry, and I underline that word official because I hope those of you in this audience who are therapists will regard yourselves as unofficial. <laughs> At least that'll give you an out. <laughs> but nevertheless, official psychiatry has curious things in common with Western religion as well as with Eastern. With Eastern, I said, only in so far as it has an interest in states of consciousness and inclines to regard other states of consciousness than the ordinary as sick. But it has one very important feature in common with Western religion. And to that, we have to go a little bit into Western religious history and ask ourselves what in Western religion, and especially in Christianity, and this goes also for Judaism, Islam, what is the great heresy? Curiously enough, the great heresy was first in the West committed by no less a person than Jesus Christ, who believed himself to be God. This, of course, will be unquestionably true if you think that the Gospel of St. John has historical value. 
It's a little vaguer in the Synoptic Gospels, but if you read the Gospel of St. John, there is absolutely no doubt about it. For he said, I and the Father are one. He who has seen me has seen the Father. Before Abraham was, I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. He said all that according to this Gospel.